off whack. Got all these, uh, figured out what was going on. Had to get all the way up there and get the power cord back down to here because there was a power cord problem. And so that's displayed now. Hezekiah assigned the priests and the Levites to divisions, each of them according to their duties, priests or Levites, to offer burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, to minister, to give thanks and sing praises at the gates of the Lord's dwelling. The king contributed from his own possessions for the morning and the evening burnt offerings, and for the burnt offerings on the Sabbaths and new moons and appointed festivals as written in the law of the Lord. He ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and Levites. They devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, oil, and honey, and all the fields produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. The men of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah also brought a tithe of their herds, flocks, and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord, their God. And they piled them in heaps. They began doing this in the third month and finished in the seventh month. And when the Hezekiah and his officials came and saw the heaps, they praised the Lord and blessed the people of Israel. Hezekiah asked the priests and the Levites about the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest from the family of Zadok, answered, Since the people began to bring their contributions to the temple of the Lord, we've had enough to eat and plenty to spare because the Lord has blessed his people and the great amount is left over. You may be seated. So I'm thinking of this Thanksgiving season. I released the kids if I haven't gone already. I'm thinking of this Thanksgiving season, how blessed we are in every aspect. And I, I'm going to start with this statement. And as a minister, one of the things that I believe our job as ministers is to do is to preach the word. And the word is to bring conviction. Convictions are how we live our life. Every one of us has some kind of conviction you live your life by. You grew up, and if you're like me, you grew up in a time where um, it's not the case as much anymore, but we grew up where you said thank you when somebody did something nice for you, and Mama gave you a whooping if you didn't, but you did say thank you. I put that in the newsletter article. You grew up where if you're a man, you were supposed to open the door for women. Nowadays, women can open doors for men, which is fine. You can say thank you to that too. But you were supposed to be gentlemanly. You opened doors. You did those things. That was things that was just a part of life. That's where you grew up. That was what I would call a conviction that had been preached to you by your parents that you live by. Honesty is the best policy. You learned that one also. You learned it either by switch or you learned it by conviction. But you got it in you. And I just took one or once or twice not to have honesty. And mom and daddy convinced you honesty is the best policy. It's the least painful And even though it's painful sometimes to be honest when you've done wrong, but you find yourself living in a time, we're living in a time where convictions are optional. And I get amazed by it. And this past week, I always like to try to bring you some weird stories. One of the weird stories I read this week was when I I saw it on Facebook. It was a minister that had a person to come into his congregation that was dressed like a woman. He was a man. And I know this guy's going to get in trouble, but his conviction is if you're a man, you don't dress like a woman, you go home and change, you're welcome here, but you're going to go home and change. You're going to change clothes and dress like a man. So I know you're a man. You can't pretend like you're something you're not. We can't have those convictions nowadays, can we? There are things that I look at. There was another one that came out also. A teacher got reassigned because a young person in the junior high, I think, that's a female, decided to identify as a male and wanted to change in the boys' locker room. And because he wouldn't oversee her changing in the boys' locker room, because it's a she still, he was reassigned to another school. He had a conviction. He said, if I was in any other sane world, if I was in the girls' locker room as a male, watching a girl undress, then I, you would fire me in a sane world. But you can't have convictions anymore. And I started looking at this, and I wonder where we're heading because it's coming craziness that we're dealing with. And, and I can preach this to you because most everybody here will shake your head going, yeah, we can figure this out. It's pretty easy. It's pretty simple, but we're living in a complicated world because the enemy is busy, and I will tell you this, the enemy wants to lie to break down absolutes. If he can break down absolutes, because there is just a male and there is just a female in this world, whether we want to call it whatever you want to call it, and you can dress it up however you want to dress it up, it's still a male and there's still a female. And you can't put a cat and a dog together to make a a bat. Those don't work. Whatever you want to make, those things don't work. And so you look at their absolutes that God has put in this world, but what the enemy tries to do 
is to lie. I appreciate that preacher. He's a black minister. It's told a fellow. You say, aren't we supposed to be a church of healing and health and a hospital for sinners? Yes, we are. But we're also a church that has convictions about right and wrong. And there are things that you hold to. And you may disagree with me. We can talk about it later. You may disagree. That doesn't show mercy and grace. I don't know the whole situation behind that minister. But I can tell you what, he was talking with conviction when he was telling that person, you need to change. We can't even say that today. People get so offended when somebody is told that you have to change. We don't want to change. We want the society to adjust around us. We want everything to happen in this culture to adjust to us, and the minority is wanting everything to move. And I know I can get a lot of head shakes out of that because we all look at it, and it gets quite frustrating. But I'll tell you something. As a church, we have got to preach the word that brings conviction, and that conviction is how we live our lives. There are absolutes that will happen in this life. We can try to deny they're there. We can try to say that that is not true, but no matter what. I mean, the world is trying, even psychologists are trying to redefine in their textbooks of what male and female is and by disorders and what we can call a disorder. Now, I was talking to, I think, Larkin or somebody, or maybe Cheryl and somebody last week, I said, it seems like it in Facebook, we post this on Facebook, and I'll probably say something one day that'll get us all in trouble. But we'll stand with convictions. You know, when I tell the person, if no matter what it is, there's got to be convictions in our life. There's got to be some things that we stand on that are absolute truths. And you say, well, can you do that with compassion? Yes, you can. There are things that happen in this life you can do with great compassion. I look in things around me, and I start wondering, because everybody always thinks that I'm pretty hard-hearted and heartless and all these things, but I do try to live my life with convictions. Is there a variance on those convictions? Not necessarily. Is there a variance on the application of those convictions? Yes. I can apply those convictions, and, and I don't have to be harsh with those convictions or anything else. Today, as we look at this scripture, and I lead into that because one of the convictions that I have, and I think it's a conviction we all need, that we are blessed to bless. We're living in a world that wants to tear down absolutes. We're living in a world that wants to say things don't really matter like they used to matter. I'm not asking us to go back to Mayberry because Mayberry is gone. We can watch the reruns. I love Mayberry. I wish we could go back to Mayberry. But it's really gone because now Mayberry has got a cross dresser. Mayberry, you know, whatever Mayberry is now. It's, it's got things in it, and you kind of go, I don't know if that's Mayberry anymore. Uh, you know, some of the, the every, every show, I turn off shows now because I get interested in them, and they introduce the same-sex relationship as being normal, and I'm going, my conviction is not challenged with that. It's just I'm insulted with that. And so I sit there and go, I don't need to be entertained with that. We will be in our convictions is what we're convinced is truth. Now, where you come by those is sometimes by the way you're raised. Sometimes you come by those by the way that you live your life. Some of it's just been handed down from your parents, but the ones that are non-negotiable are those things that were built in us through the Word of God and what you're convinced that is the Word of God. And I find myself as I read the Word, and one of the things I am convinced of is we are blessed to bless others. The reason we have, and you can find this to be the case no matter where, and I think there was a study years ago, and there are people that will challenge this. There was a study years ago that you can preach the message of being blessed. You're blessed to be blessed. You can preach that even in the ghetto, and it will raise the standard of living people's lives if they understand that. If they understand even what little bit you have, because I've watched people that have lived in poverty, but they have a generosity of heart, and they are blessed, and you say, well, they still lived in that place, but they had a blessing in their life. There was nothing that you couldn't, I mean, you could not never outgive them because that's what their life was. That was a conviction they lived their lives. Now, I'm going to be talking about giving today. I'm going to talk about the blessing of what God has given us and that we need to have our hearts checked on our convictions from time to time. But our lives are by what we live by, those non-negotiable truths that we have in our lives. And one of those is that we're blessed to bless. And I would find myself that there is a right and wrong, but what I am finding, there's an assault upon the truth today in every aspect of life. And the enemy comes, and he said, and even what we see in the Scriptures in the New Testament, it says there is what's called the father of lies, which is Satan, the adversary. He is out there to lie to us in every way we can. I appreciate when I, I mention that preacher, I mention that teacher, I appreciate people that will stand with their convictions, that will say, this is how I'm going to live my life, and it's a non-negotiable. Now, you say, well, that's just, 
and, and some people want to argue, so are you trying to live by the law? You trying? No, 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 no. There are non-negotiables in our life. And we find ourselves, the older you get, the more they become negotiable. It shouldn't be that way. It should become firmer. One of the guys that I lived around up in Tennessee that, that was one of the elders in our church, you could set your watch by his life. I mean, he was just that way. And Leonard, Mar Leonard uh, Lyndon Martin, I loved him. But he had non-negotiables in his life. There were things that when you saw him, you knew what you were going to get was Leonard. You couldn't change his mind on things. I remember he'd laugh about stuff and people trying to change his mind on something. He said, there's no way you're going to change me on this. He said, it's just the way it is. The way I see it, and here's where our non-negotiables should come from, the Word of God. It shouldn't come from necessary experience, even though you might be raised that possums are really good to eat. I've seen what they eat. I don't really want to eat a possum. You, you say, who would be raised on that? There are people raised that way. I just hadn't found anything delectable about a possum. There are people who might live with that conviction, or they may have a conviction about certain things, and you may just kind of shake your head and say, that's not my conviction. That's okay if it's not based on the Word of God. I can't find anywhere in the Word of God that says I've got to eat possum. Probably I can find the opposite. But I do find there are people that live their lives by some kind of conviction, something that is good. And they live their lives in those convictions. But what I have found that as we look at Scripture, we find those things that if we live our lives by, it will, and if you live your life by conviction based on the Word, and I'll use the word that we read here a while ago, it will heap blessings upon your life. Will there be testings? Will there be times that will be troubles? Yes. There are going to be some times when you will make a stand that people will look at it, and I find myself in this day and time, and, and I wonder what life is like, because I will say that there are still very much absolutes that we live with in our life. And we got to live that way as a church, and it's a hard balance. I can tell you as a pastor at times, because you'll see there are absolutes here, but you want to reach people, and you want people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. How do you keep your absolutes and yet not offend anybody? It's kind of like when a preacher preaches on the tithe. How do you say something about the tithe without offending those who are tithing? I'm not looking to even do that today. I'm not looking to offend anybody that doesn't want to give. I look at you and say, here's what, as a minister, the best I can tell our job in these pulpits that I think we're doing a weak job of today because we want everybody to feel good about themselves and we've bought into the cultural lie that everybody has to feel good. That's a cultural lie. I want to tell you something. When God came to me in my life, he didn't make me feel good. I felt bad. There was a sorrow unto salvation because he showed me where I was wrong. And anytime God comes to me, he got permission to tell me where I am wrong. And I have found myself, if I want to live in the heaps of blessing, I've got to walk in the conviction of the word of God. And to walk in that blessing of God means that I've got to have some kind of non-negotiable convictions in my life. I say all that because I said when we preach the word, what I, my hope is, I don't want to stand here and just bump my gums and be bumping my gums, but what I want people to understand is to preach the word means that we have those non-negotiables that we live our lives by. And that we're even willing to die by. You'll find that Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego had that conviction in their life and there were non-negotiables that they said, this is the way it's going to be. Even if it costs me our li my life, I'm willing to live by this. And so you'll find there are going to be assaults today. Anything that we have a conviction of, there will be an assault on. What I see in Scripture, and I look at this, and I find myself in the conviction of the Word of God, because the Bible says that our convictions are built, I believe, in our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotion. I'm going to try to stay with this the way I believe the Lord leading it. I'm really wanting to be off this way, but I'm going to stay with it. Our mind, our will, and emotion is what our soul's made up. And so your convictions are made up when somebody preaches a word to you. Your mind's got to be changed because our mind's got to be renewed. According to the worldly pattern of this world, your mind is being trying to be tricked because everybody looks at something, and I've had people to do this as a, as a Christian. They've come to me and they say, look, it's the way of the world. It's the culture. I've even got brothers and sisters that preach to me about the homosexuality, same-sex marriage. They're good Christian folks that are preaching to me that this has got to be accepted in the church, that we have to have this. I'm saying, no, there's some non-negotiables that because there's no pass with sin. That includes me. I get no pass. I have to be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have to repent. That's any of us. That's a non-negotiable to me, and I look at it and say, nobody's born that way. Nobody's born. We're all born into sin. And so I look at this, and I find those convictions are there, but the thing that the world tries to do is it tries to form this image, and it says, this is the proper thought of today in the think tank, and you've got to follow that. Well, the Word of God says opposite of this, so what are you going to follow? Your conviction is found in your soul. 
And that's what's got to be changed. Your soul has to be transformed. Your mind has to be transformed, according to Romans, the 12th chapter. And if the world is assaulting your mind to transform your mind back to it, then you've got to stay in the Word to find that conviction of mind. And then there's a conviction of heart, your mind, will, and your emotion. You find those will, your choices, your emotions. I don't care how you feel about somebody, you cannot be led emotionally. you led with truth. If you're led with your emotions, they can be tricky. I can love somebody and have a great emotional feel towards somebody. I love, let me just use, since I talk about the homosexual aspect, I love the homosexual. I do. But I love them to get them out of the sin. I don't want them to stay. I love the alcoholic. My conviction is you can be set free. The Word of God says you can be set free. I even love the person that has done harm to somebody. I believe you can be forgiven. My heart is for, and I think I'm in good standing because God's heart, he wishes for no one to perish, but all to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's a conviction that is of God, I believe, that I can see in Scripture. Paul said that he loved the Berean church because in Acts you'll see, and this is what they did. And anytime you preach, somebody preaches a word to you, you need to go and examine it for yourself. You need to find out, is this really the truth that I need to be bringing that conviction? There are churches out there, and I hate to say this, but Joel Olstein can pack in a crowd, but everybody I've talked to recently, they say, ask me about thing. They've talked about Joel. He's not talking about near as much as he was at one time. But they'll ask me, I said, don't, you know, after about a few weeks of listening to him, I just, I feel good, but I don't get any conviction. Because if you don't preach the word that is going to challenge your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions, if you're not challenged for change, then yeah, it's just a feel-good thing. You'll say, well, that might not be totally fair, but here's what even we're challenged to do in Acts, the 17th chapter. He said, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Silas and Paul away to Berea. He said, on arriving, they said they preached the word. And he said, those that in Thessalonica, they received the message even greater than those in Thessalonica with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if Paul said what he said and see what it was true. So they were not just listening to him, but they were examining the scriptures. Why? Because they said, this is affecting my soul. This is something's challenging me. The word should always challenge us. We should never stay the same. When we come to church... If we stay the same, I think we're missing out on something if a conviction does not challenge us somewhere. And what I mean by conviction is that change of heart, that transformation. The Bereans looked at the Word and they said, I like what you're saying, but let me examine this Word to make sure it's in there. They ought to be, we ought to be like the Bereans to do that. But also you see in, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, You'll see the Word of God is there to separate. It said the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of heart. Man, does that, you hear that? It is there to bring conviction into our soul. It's there to transform our soul. Now, the spirit man is born again. It's the one that's supposed to be feeding. But we find ourselves and our soul is the challenge. Because how many times have you been told something and then nowadays it's being challenged? I mean, I've had... You try to open a door for a feminist. I don't need that. Okay. <laughs> I can step back. You know, I'm just trying to be nice, you know. Or you don't know how to, you know, it's like, I, I, it, it just buffaloes me today because I, I still operate in Mayberry world and I still operate as if this is the way we live and that the Word of God is still true. That's why when you look at the monkey trials, you go back, the reason evolution is so important of the, the lie of evolution to the world. It's a lie. The reason it's so important, it tears down the very foundations of Genesis. If you tear down Genesis, you can tear down the whole scripture as it goes. That's the reason we have the abortion issue today. I know I'm not doing anything on scripture, but I'm going to follow this, what I read to you. The reason we have the abortion issue today, it's not about women's rights, it's about killing babies. Okay? Because 50% at least of those babies that are killed are women. If it was women's rights, we'd save 50% of them has nothing to do with that. The conviction of the world is I cannot be inconvenienced. And because the conviction of the world is that, and they've preached that to us so long, the conviction always takes action, and that's why we have abortion as we have it today. You know, say, well, it's a matter of, it's a choice. No, it not is a choice. The choice was made, and the pregnancy happened a lot of times. Very few are of rape or incest. And those are a whole other thing, and everybody wants to throw that up. But I will tell you this, and you can say, well, this has nothing to do with Thanksgiving and everything. It really doesn't, but I'm staying with it. Because I do believe convictions are very important. And we're living in a time where you're going to be challenged. 
We're seeing it right now in our nation being torn apart because there, there's people that said, this is what is right. And people say, no, this is the fuzzy area that we're supposed to be living in. I said, no. I'll tell you this, most every one of you, if there was any, we look at what we're challenged with today, most everyone in this room would lay their lives down for any child if you're walking across that road right now and there was a car coming and you could stop that. Most every one of us had a conviction saying, no, I will do whatever I can. I will do whatever I can. That's a conviction, folks. We have a conviction that when we pray with people on the cross, we have a conviction saying there's something important about preaching the Word of God and people coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why, and I will tell you, as long as I'm preacher in the Cone Presbyterian Church, I will reject the idea that there are multiple ways to God. There is only one way. That is a conviction that is non-negotiable. There's a lot of people who say, hey, everybody's going to get to God one day. No, no. The Muslim preaches hate. Hate for anybody that is not Muslim. The Christian says, you can convert, or if you do not, it is your choice. God loves you enough, and I, I don't even fathom this, but God loved the world so much he sent his son that whosoever believes shall live and not die. And I'm looking at that going, he wishes for no one to perish, but you know what? He loves us so much that if you choose not to be with him, it's your choice. I don't get it. My boys don't even have that choice. But God loves us that much. I look at this today and I'm saying, God, give us that conviction. Give us that, that mark of ownership in our life and that the power of the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Why I'm, I got on this this week, because I'm really believing God wants us to walk in the blessings of him. And to walk in the blessings of him, it's got to be built in that conviction. One of those areas, and I, I talk about the tithe, one of those areas is in tithing. It is a conviction. My parents built in me that thing, and I can't get away from it. I can remember as a kid, it's a conviction that everything is God's. That's just one of those things. reason we tithe is not so, and I'll tell you this, it's not so this preacher can separate you from your money, because no preacher could ever separate somebody from their money. No, they can't. If God can't do it, ain't no preacher can do it. I look at it, that one of the statements we make as a Christian is the ownership of who our, who, who's our king and our God. One of those statements that we see, and I've had people argue with me about it and ownership of this, that's why you see, and I, the reason I read that scripture is the first thing that they did when they had a revival was the tithe came in. And when Hezekiah came in there, he says, where did all this come from? He says, the people, they just keep bringing it. They bring it in because they believe it's, it, it was a conviction that happened in their life. You see, they had a dedication of the temple in the chapter before this. They had the Passover lamb that was good. They had all kind of things. They were having a revival in the nation. And one of the outcroppings of that, they were convicted. They said, God, you have blessed us so much. Let us bless others. They looked at it and they said, they're going to bring this into the storehouse. See, the tithe is that show of, of ownership. We're living in a time when the world will tell us thing, one thing and we have to either choose to believe it or not. It's an assault upon our soul. It's an assault upon the very foundation of what we see. And, and I'll tell you this, you can be a Christian and believe in evolution, but you can also be a Christian and be wrong. You can say, well, I'm a biologist and da-da-da-da-da, but there is no proof. It's a faith-built religion. You say, well, what does that got to do with anything? Because I believe the very foundations of Scripture. And you say, well, I don't want to believe the world is 6,000 years old. I believe it's millions of years old. All right, that's fine. You can believe what you want, but we need to search Scriptures and find out what is true. We need to find out where the missing link is. We've got to find out where the spork, you know, the spoon and the fork came together and evolved into a spork, where that came from. We can't find that. That's funny to some people. That's the missing link. What we have found in this is that we preach the truth of the word. It should bring conviction. What I see in the scripture here that I read to you out of Second Chronicles, the reason I love that is because the people's response was out of conviction of the Lord. Anything that we do should be out of the conviction of the Lord. The reason I say we're blessed to bless. We're here not just to say, hey, God, thank you for what you've done for us. When I talk about when you receive salvation, if you hold it to yourself, shame on you. Shame on you. If you don't tell anybody about what Jesus has done for you, shame on you. You say, preacher, you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to make all of us feel good about ourselves. Folks, I'll feel good when we get to heaven one day and we can't witness anymore. 
that day's done. When we get to heaven, and every person that's on this cross right here we're praying for is there with us. I feel good then. And we'll all go, hallelujah, let's dance for the Lord because the witnessing days are over. We can't do it anymore, but until that time comes, our job is we're blessed to bless. That is a conviction. If you don't hear anything else out of this day, I want you to be convicted of that. The tithe is one of those things that you'll see here. That was an outcropping of how they were blessed. And they said, look, for seven months they kept bringing in this blessing. They said, we're going to bring the first fruits into this thing. We're going to make sure, and you see this, and, and people want to argue with me. They'll say, no, we're going to go with New Testament giving. The, the tithe was a part of the law. No, it wasn't. You go back to Genesis 14 before the law was even given. You'll see where Abraham gave of his tithe to Melchizedek. It was way before that. It was a mark of ownership. It was a conviction of heart that said, boom, here it is. I ain't, I'm not even preaching this to you so we can build the coffers of this church up. I'm just saying, make sure we're giving the blessings back to the Lord. And when we make a statement, we're saying, I am God's. That's one way we make a statement. Another way we make a statement is saying, when you see somebody that's in need, you tell them about Jesus. Or you see somebody that's in need, you give them a cup of cold water, and you tell them, this is why I'm giving you a cup of cold water. I am blessed to bless others. It's not so the blessings stop here. I do believe as we look at the conviction we see in the New Testament, Old Testament, you'll see that the people of God, whenever they saw that conviction of God, there was an outpouring of things that would happen. There were things on the external that would happen. Anytime there's a conviction of heart, you'll find that it will have an effect on everything around you. We had our family gathering yesterday here on my dad's side of the family, all the cousins. We got this thing together and we started getting together. One of the things I shared with them, I, I said a prayer and the Lord really just got on me and said, why don't you say something about me? I know it's your family and you expect everybody here to know you, know me, but just say something about me. And I was telling them, I said, look, the way you live your life, parents, because we had a lot of little kids that come I said, the way you live your life is the way they're going to live their lives. Make sure you got your convictions intact. You can say one thing and expect them to do something different, but it ain't going to happen. They're going to do as you do. That's why I appreciate, and I'll go back, let me just go back to this real quick, one of the illustrations that when I was growing up, we always have during Thanksgiving time, you'd always have the stewardship month. And everybody had to sign up on what they were going to give, and you'd have envelopes. I never, I remember this day, they had 52 envelopes you'd get. Maybe throw an extra bonus two in. I don't know. But you'd have your number on there, on that envelope. And you get your envelope. I remember the first time I got my envelopes as a kid. I said, I got my own envelopes. I get to give. I mean, it was a blessing to know that I get to give. And every week you had your envelope you'd stick in. And it was like, man, I've, I'm growing up. That was a part of growing up. And would write a passage at Rocky Ridge. Get you, I'd go out that, in November. I'd say, my envelopes would always be out there. And everybody, every family would have theirs. And I had my own that time. I thought, man, this is good stuff. Got an envelope. But also, it was one of those things that God has always reminded me, you are mine. I will take care of you. All I ask you to do is return thanks, to be a blessing to others. I love that he saved my soul. I love that I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. I love that he has healed me. I love that he's transforming me. You hear the ing part? I'm not there yet, but he is transformed. I love that. But I also love that I can share that with others. That the heaps of blessing. And I love when Hezekiah walked in and said, what is all this? What is all this? He said, it's the blessings that have been heaped in here. It's just a pile of blessings. You know where the pile of blessings come from? It's when you live out your convictions and you speak your convictions. Is it always going to be fun? No, it ain't going to be fun. I remember at college we spoke our convictions and made people mad. I remember on the job, I spoke my convictions out in the construction world, and people got upset. I remember everywhere you get, but I want to tell you something. Even those guys on the job, they'd come back to you, and they'd say, look, I need prayer. I need prayer. Will you pray for me, preacher? In those tough times, they say, look, I want to be healed. Will you pray for me, preacher? Yeah. They knew where the base was and convictions was. So convictions sustain us when feelings fail us. Convictions do not change because they're based in the, the convictions do not change are based in the Word of God. Why is that important? Because our souls need to be renewed, and the absolute truths of Scripture should guide us. One of those aspects we'll see is the tithe that you read here in this passage. They responded with the tithe, with offerings. We're not going to take up another offering here today, but I'm telling you, 
our lives should be a response with the conviction of heart. Have you been saved from your sins? Let's give them the first fruits of our praise, not the leftovers of our gripes. We're living in a time where it's like, well, I don't have what, what Mary has or what Ryan has or what Jackie has. I don't have that, so God must not love me. No. God loves you. He has saved your soul. He has set you free. And then he's given you a path, and he's like, look, and, and one of the things I know about this right here, one of the things God convicted me years ago, he said, if it's just 10% he's asking, I have no problem with that because that is a mark of ownership of the 100%. I don't have to argue about it. I was like, God, this is as holy as this. We find this sacred object. And I find myself looking at it and I say, God, how can I express? But it's also in our witness and everything that we do. Our souls are being transformed. As we're being transformed, that conviction has got to be there so that the world may know. Now the world is going to challenge everything. They're going to, the devil will come and lie to you about everything. Well, you can do this, it's just like that, or you can be. No, there are certain non-negotiables that I have found in Scripture. They say, bring the tithe into the storehouse. That's what the people did. They said the heaps of blessing. They didn't just say, hey, I'm going to go out and give it to this or give it to that. They said, no, we're bringing it into the storehouse. God has blessed us, let's do that. And there are certain things when the Bible says that we've been saved, why are we saved? So that we make other disciples. It's not so that I hold on to it and say, oh, man, this feels good. I'm going to heaven. Yeah. You know what that does to the world when we don't share how to get there? They look at you and say, that's kind of raw. You're not inviting me. When I tell people, and I tell people whether it's the tithe, whether it's being a blessing to others out there, and when we walk in this earth, there's sometimes that God will tell you. He said, I want you to bless this person. He'll say, but they don't deserve a God. And it's not about them. It's about you at that point. It's about you. If it's your stuff, you don't have to bless them. But if it's God's stuff, you got to bless them. Salvation is God's stuff. It ain't your stuff. Salvation ain't yours to hold on to until you depart this life. It's yours to give. Anybody that's, that's received it, and it's the same thing with the blessings of God. That's why the tithe in this, this scripture right here, you'll see the heaps of blessing came because the people realize what God has given us, we can't hold on to. we got to give it away. That's everything of life. That's the conviction that we live by. Having truths, and, I, and, and I'll go back to that preacher I started with, the black preacher. He's going to get in trouble on the Internet. But I'll tell you something. What I heard in his voice was conviction. You might not agree with him how he did it, but I heard conviction. You know why we look at even, I don't agree with everything President Trump. You know why some people like him? Because he got some conviction. I'm not preaching he's the best thing in the world since sliced bread. I'm not. He's got his faults just like everybody else and some things I wish he wouldn't do. But I'll tell you this, what the world is longing for is somebody to have conviction. You know why our churches aren't growing? Because we want to meld and look like the world. I told people and I laugh about it because I said I, I tuck my shirts in and I don't have enough hair to spike. I get so sick of these young guys, if you tuck, untuck your shirt, if I can just walk around like this and have my hair spiked, y'all all come. That makes you want to come to church, doesn't it? I'm just like you. Oh, all your shirts are tucked in. Sorry. It's the world. The world says we got to do this. And I'll tell you something. That, that flower is fading this day and time because they're wanting conviction, not somebody that's going to make them feel good, and we all go home and say, whoo, that made me feel good. I tiptoed through the tulips. Go to church. Jesus wants our life. And he says, I gave my life for you. Are you willing to lay your life down for a friend? Are you willing to bless others? And I know I'm distracting you with this, but I can't help you. I'll tuck it in later. Maybe they, they're waiting to come in out there. They just saw me untuck my shirt. These seats are going to be filled next week because I got I'll spike my hair up just so we can have seats. No. And y'all think, hey, I forgot. And we unbutton my sleeves too. I love my brother Jimmy up in, ten, in Tennessee. He was trying to meld with the younger church. <laughs> he looked at that young man he told him one day he says don't you have any grown up clothes <laughs> I'm old enough I can say that too because he'd come in with all these clothes tight jeans all this stuff he's like don't you have any grown up clothes that people respect I understand that 
I have found myself in this day and time, the world is looking for some conviction. Church, let's live with it. Conviction tells the world of whose you are. It's not about the trappings that we can do. It tells the world. You know what? We may not be the largest church, but people know where we stand. And I look at it. I don't want anybody to be excluded. I don't want anybody that's struggling with homosexuality, that's struggling with alcoholism, that's struggling. But it's not about saying, hey, I want you to come and just feel comfortable. And uh, No, it's a challenge that I had to face when I came to Jesus that I had to change. And, when I, and I talk about the tithe. If I say anything about the tithe, I don't want to offend anybody. But you've got to change if it's not there. That's a conviction in the Word. If I talk about giving your lives and being a witness and you get mad at me saying, well, preacher, that's just not me. It can be you. That's my best Joel Olstein. It can be you with the untucked shirt. Paul says, do all things, try to draw some. Maybe I do need to untuck my shirt and spike my hair and talk like Joel. I don't know. Here's the deal. When I started this, I really, I was trembling up here when I was praying. Because what's lacking from our churches today a lot of times is that conviction. Conviction of life that guides who we are. When you leave here today, if you are believing the word of God that you've got to know Jesus Christ, then everybody you come in contact with needs to know Jesus Christ. And the reason you come in contact with them is so you can be a messenger of that message. The reason we see in Scripture a lot of times those things that are, that are so critical, and I look at it and I'm going, God, let us search the Scriptures like the Bereans and make sure we're living in truth. I challenge you. If you think this is wrong, challenge me. Let's come back at it and we'll talk in Scripture some more. Let's see what it is. You say, well, preacher, I, I've had people challenge me on the tithe. They say, I believe in New Testament giving. I'll say, okay, that's good. The New Testament giving is you give it all up. Give it all away. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? You want New Testament giving? That's it. Write a check for the whole thing. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I don't believe that. Let's go back to the 10%. Where do your convictions lie? In life. Let's live it like we believe it, folks. The world is waiting, and, and it will challenge you. You might be like the guy that got reassigned because he didn't want to go into the boys' room to watch a young girl undress because he thought it was wrong. That conviction got him assigned to another place. But he was right. The world is wrong. I don't care how crazy they get. The sanity you find in scriptures is living that scriptural conviction. Folks, this week, you are blessed to bless. This season, look at me. Christmas season, you're blessed to bless. The only reason you have what you have is say, Lord, it is not mine. Nothing I have is mine. What is it I can give? What is it that you want of me? My words, my life, my everything, everything. I'm sorry you don't feel good about yourself, but hopefully this helps you. Let's stand together. We got a service tonight. I invite you to come. Let's go ahead. We'll sing a song. I'd soften up my message a little bit, maybe. We got a service tonight. I invite you to come. I want you to be there. It's good to be a part of the body of Christ besides ours. I will tell you this also. I want you to be so attuned to those in your family because one of the convictions I tell you that, I mean, the Lord really just sat down on me at my family reunion. He said, why aren't you saying something to your family? There may be somebody here because I made an assumption. It's my family. Everybody knows all actions are saved. And God said, no, you got to say something. Say something. I'm like, okay. Before you eat, you got to do that, though. People pay attention better then. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. In a world that is meshing together a bunch of non-convictions or the convictions of the enemy, they're trying to push that as an agenda God, help us to be the light. Help us to let your word divide our souls asunder so that we know where truth lies. And then in that, and, and where the truth is, the lies can't stay. And so, Father, it's not about what our pet peeves or what we want. It's about your word that can transform lives. 
And Lord, to leave the addict in their addiction, it's wrong. To leave the sinner without the message of hope is wrong. And so, Father, I pray that we who have the message, the message of hope, the message of life, that we're blessed to bless others. And Lord, just as we see the heaps of blessing that Hezekiah asked about, Father, I pray that we'll walk in this building and say, where did these blessings come from? Where did it come from? And it's not just about the monetary, but Father, it is about the blessings of lives, people coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, convict us and let us live our lives with that conviction of truth. In the name of Jesus, let's sing. If you have a prayer need, I invite you to come. Father, I pray that you will just bless as we go from this place, that we are your blessing to bless others. I thank you for that. I thank you that you've blessed us, you've protected us. 
And Lord, I ask you that as a church, we hold your standard of truth. And by doing so, we will bless this nation because it has not changed. Your truth will stand firm. Even with the assault of the lies of today, your truth will stand firm. And I thank you so much for how you blessed us in the name of Jesus. Bless others and go forth. Amen.